had a client that we were doing card abandonment emails. Every card abandonment email we sent generated $16. Well, how would you like it if every email you sent generated $16? I mean, we'd all be very wealthy. Um, there were other emails that generated 0.016. And so when you talk to management about what we need to be doing, stuff like that makes it really clear and it's hard for them to argue with those numbers. Like I said, unless it's like, oh, well, that was the message from the president. We need to keep doing it. But it's hard to argue with, you know, this is a limited resource. If we over mail our list, they're going to stop opening and responding. There's erosion that happens. Hello and welcome to episode number three of emailgeeks.show, the podcast where once a month the leading email experts share the knowledge about email marketing, email deliverability and marketing. My name is Sela Yoffe and I am an email deliverability consultant working with global email senders, startups and email platforms about their email deliverability and email authentication and strategy, and I'm the host of this podcast. My guest today is Jim Jennings, the general manager of Only Influencers, the original community of email industry professionals. She is also the chair of Email Innovation World and the founder and CEO of Email Optimization Shop based in Washington, D.C. Good morning, Jim. It's great to have you on the show. Hey, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast today, Sela. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and yeah, it's been great getting to know you through Only Influencers, which we call OI for short. I think it's, um, it's really neat. OI is the original community of mm-hmm. email industry professionals. It started about 13 years ago, uh, officially, but there was actually an unofficial core group of us that were on the list before that uh, by Bill McCloskey. Um, and I took it over when he retired, mm-hmm. but, um, only influencers is really neat. It's, um, basically anyone who's in the email industry can join and, um, it's a way to meet other people in the industry and network, which is great for your career, whether you're looking to hire people or whether you're looking for your own next job move. Mm-hmm. Um, but more than that, it's a place where people can go to talk about email. So we have some really interesting discussions, um, we, When the pandemic started, we started doing a Thursday live Zoom, which I often see you on. Yeah. <laughs> and we bring in uh, people who have authored industry columns and we talk about topics. And I think it's really neat to get the chance to talk to people who are writing about these things, things like uh, Apple's MPP, um, acquisitions when they come up, any kind of new technology that comes in, we talk about. Um, so it's really a neat group. And I, there's a lot of people like you that I've met through there that I've never actually met in person, but I consider you industry friends because you just get to know people. Um, a lot of the people that you read in the email marketing world are members of only influencers, people yeah. like Chad White with Oracle Marketing Consulting and Jenna Tiffany with Let's Talk Strategy and Gavin Legini from Dot Digital. Um, and so really, we just... Um, We're a group of email marketing industry professionals. We want to help members with their careers, but members also have very much an, an outward perspective of trying to do things that are in the best interest of the industry. I find it fascinating how the email community is always ready to help each other. Yeah, well, you know, the industry has always, always, always um, been one where people help each other. I think it's because a lot of us started in this industry very early. I started my career in online in 1989 with CompuServe, which was really early. And so a lot of us kind of grew up in this industry. And when you're doing that, you know, at CompuServe, we used to call online bleeding edge. It wasn't cutting edge. It was bleeding edge. <laughs> And you were trying to figure it out. And it was really neat because as people figured it out, they were very generous with writing about it. So, you know, you have people like um, Jacob Nielsen, who was very early in the usability and websites and, and, and things like that. Um, you also have a lot of people in the email industry that, that were very there very early. I was sort of on that early group, but also Karen Talavera, who's Synchronicity Marketing, and Kath Pay with Holistic Email, and Lauren yeah. McDonald, who's been with, who's now left us for the electric car vehicle industry, <laughs> but was very active when he was with Silver Pop. Um, and it's it's neat because even when people were at competitive organizations, they were friendly. And that's really what only influencers really wants to continue and make sure doesn't leave the industry. The idea of people helping each other, the idea of people working together for the greater good of the industry, which mm-hmm. has always been part of it. And you know, to that end, we do a lot of things that benefit members. 
But we also do a lot of things that benefit non-members. So things like our Only Influencers newsletter, which gets published once a week. Janet Roberts, um, who is a a well-known name in the industry, is actually our newsletter editor and does a great job. We usually have anywhere from nine to 12 articles about what's hot and going on in the industry. Typically, the first two or three are from our blog. And then we... We actively feature our members' articles because a lot of our members are influencers. So that's really great. We also have, as I mentioned, our blog. um, And that's another thing that's free. Even if you're not a member, you can read those. Um, And then we do webinars. Mm -hmm. Um, It's Actually, we're calling it a community update. Um, And then we do special reports. Another area of interest for the industry is diversity, um, primarily racial diversity. So we recently published our second annual racial diversity in the email industry report. And we actually have a goal to try to make the industry match the population at large by um, January, 2025. Mm -hmm. Um, We're also having a gender diversity special report. Um, And then we have the OI metrics project, which is actually oimetrics.com that we launched, which is basically a resource for people to get to understand email marketing metrics more. I think that Numbers are really important to this channel, and that's mm-hmm. how you're going to improve. <laughs> and that's uh, that's what the Metrics Project is set up for. And we actually recently did a Masters of Email Marketing Metrics quiz, where we invited people to answer 10 questions. Um, all of the answers to these questions were available on oimetrics.com, and we actually linked to it. And uh, it was interesting, out of about, I think, 79 people who took it, only six got them all right. So there's a real People need from at- the industry. People yeah. from the industry, yeah. <laughs> the average score was like a D. Um, I think the average score was like less than seven out of 10, right? So um, there's a real need out there to understand these numbers because once you understand them, it makes you even better at your job. It makes you much more powerful. Yeah. Um, it ma- gives you the ability to do a lot more with your program. So that's another thing. Again, all of these things are available for people who aren't members. Um I think the thing that you miss if you're not a member is the networking opportunities, which I think is actually quite valuable. So yeah, we invite people to join. It's 200 a year, or if you want to join on a monthly basis, it's $20 a month. And literally anyone who's in the email marketing industry can join. You don't have to be someone who's blogged for 20 years about it, who's been working in the industry for 30 years. Really anyone is welcome. And um, we love to have new people. I always find the Tuesday calls very valuable and I almost never miss them. Yeah, and that's one thing we want to keep alive. And, you know, the other nice thing about the the Thursday calls is, first of all, it's cameras on. Yeah. So it's not a webinar. It's not a lecture. It's literally a discussion. And we really, we don't record them. So if you want to be a part of it, you have to be there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, a lot of friendships have been made. A lot of business deals have been struck. Yeah from those Thursday events. And when else are you going to have the chance of being a group of, typically we have, you know, around 20 people talking to a Chad White or whoever is is the author and even just, you know, sharing ideas and thoughts. So it's, it's really kind of a special thing. We're very proud of it. Yeah. I'm so glad that you're a part of it too. But, but just to be sure, yeah, it's onlyinfluencers.com. So O-N-L-Y-I-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E-R-S.com. And if you go there, you can read the blog, you can sign up for the newsletter, and you can also uh, register to join us. And also we have our past webinars there available on demand, as well as our special reports for download. And you can also see about our upcoming webinars, which are which are free. So yeah, I encourage everyone to check it out. It's, it's really a great resource. I, I should say that I was a member from the start and I was a huge fan. And then when Bill retired and asked me to step in, it was uh, they were big shoes to fill, but I was honored to do it. So I've been a fan of OI long before I was the general manager. You're also the programming chair and moderator for Email Innovation World. Can you share more on that? Um, the idea behind our conference, we really try to set ourselves apart. There's a lot of conferences where you can go to learn the basics of, you know, email marketing and, you know, what is deliverability. And we don't really cover that. We really are focused on innovations. We, we want... Um, to provide people who have successful programs mm-hmm. with the information they need to take them to the next level. Um, so it's really a place to come, not if you're a newbie and you don't really know email marketing, but if you've got a successful program, you know you know enough to be dangerous, um, come <laughs> here and learn what you really need to know to take your program to the next level. The Email Innovation World event will take place from June 5 to June 7. 
2024 at the Sheraton Phoenix Downtown Hotel in Phoenix, Arizona. You can register by going to emailinnovationworld.com and I'll put the link in the show notes. In the email industry, many people say they unintentionally ended up working in email. They fell into email. There is even a t-shirt with this slogan. What did your journey into email look like? Wow. Well, you know, I started in online right out of graduate school. I went to work for CompuServe and uh, I was working in a dot com and I was um, doing email, but I was also doing other channels. And um, my boss there left and went to uh, read business information, mm-hmm. which is read Elsevier, B2B publisher, largest one in the country back then. Um, and it was actually called Connors before it was called B- read business information which some people know the Connor's name. And I'll never forget because I, I had, went up to New York and I had lunch with him. And he said, I really want to hire you here. And I said, I would really love to work for you here. <laughs> and he said, here's the thing. <laughs> he's like, I've got approval for a few, a few positions right now. Mm-hmm. And he's like, one of them is, um, is email marketing. And uh, you would be head of all... email marketing for product development and you'd have a dotted line to the marketing team to do email marketing with them I have confidence in you and I know that you can do this so you know why don't you take this role and I'll make you a promise if in six months you're not happy with email <laughs> by that time I'll have some other positions I can hire and I will I will move you somewhere because I know that I want you on my team and you know but this is just this is what I have and I think I think you'll you'll like it but if you don't and I was like you know what I'm I'm happy to do it to work with you let's let's do this let's give it a shot and um, I gotta tell you I have never looked back I just I love email um, once I I had you know I knew a little bit about it but I really dove into the industry back then click Z mm-hmm. was one of the main publications and I remember every morning going to click Z and reading what was there about email marketing and And, um, and then about a year in, I actually um, met some folks at Click Z and they asked if I would write a column, which was thrilling to me. So I got to write a column there for, I wrote for them for like over 12 years, every other week. Um, so yeah, I guess I kind of fell into it. I, I, I have Mark Potts, who is now uh, back in the consulting world uh, to thank for it. Um, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's just been really great. And, you know, I remember going to my first conference and, mm-hmm. And seeing Lauren McDonald at the bar and I ran up to Lauren and I said hi you don't know me but I've been reading your stuff and I just think you're so smart and and he looks at me and he goes oh you're Gene Jennings <laughs> said, I am. and he said I've been reading your stuff um, so stuff like that I think was really cool that um, you know back in the day so yeah it's been it's been a fun ride and just super nice people in the industry I think that's the other reason I've really stayed some of my very best friends are in the industry now um, and you That's just how the industry is. You have worked with interesting brands as a boutique email marketing consultant for many years. I do, I do. Um, I, I actually started my uh, boutique consultancy email optimization shop mm-hmm. back in t- uh, 2001. So it's been about 20 years now. Amazing. And um, I've been... I've worked really hard but I've, I've been really lucky I've worked with some great brands like Hasbro and Verizon and synchrony financial and Capital One um, PayPal um, so it's been it's been a really fun ride um, and I feel really lucky I've done I do b2b I do b2c I do all sorts of industries uh, AARP National Association of Realtors National Education Association um, so it's been it's been really really great you One of your areas of expertise is assisting brands in determining what's effective and what's not. Could you provide a case study? I would love that. Um, a big part of my work with clients is um, actually doing AB split testing for them. Um, it's important to AB split test, even if you're sure that a change you're going to make is going to improve performance. You want to you make sure your audience agrees with you on that. Um, the other nice thing about AB split testing is if every, anyone ever asks why you made that change last year, you mm-hmm. questions it you can just pull the report and say we made this change because it increased revenue by 46 percent and usually people go oh okay um, so it really gets it out of the realm but the other thing that I run into is you know obviously we want our emails to be attractive mm-hmm. but mostly I want them to make money so um, 
what is attractive is is very subjective. I yeah. might like an email and you might dislike it or vice versa, but which one made more money is not subjective at all. And that's typically what it's about or which one generated the most leads or whatever. So so that's the other reason A-B split testing is really good. Yeah, A-B testing is done differently in each email platform. So, so here's the thing of it, right? I would say in most cases, perhaps not all, but in most cases, that A-B split test functionality that your ESP builds into its software, in it most sucks. cases, it's absolutely useless. <laughs> and worse than that, it actually can send you in the wrong direction. Um, and they, you know, I know that they're trying, I know that they are, but you know, I have a client right now that does an AB split test on their subject line before every send. And what they do is they do a pre-send. So they take out a small portion mm -hmm. of the list. They split it in two. They send two different subject lines, um, like two or three hours later, whichever subject line has the highest click through rate. So this at least is going to click through rate. That's what they send to everyone. But what I found out was that, um, in most cases, the sample sizes they're using are so small that the results are not statistically significant. Yeah. And if they're not statistically significant, it means there's there's no difference. So again, it's a coin flip what they're telling you to use. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to the fact that, you know, and they're better than most. Most people, if it's a subject line test, they're going to want to use open rate as your KPI, which is awful. They're <laughs> using click-through rate. But again, going back to that analysis that I did, S that is only accurate 7% of the time. Well, so with those two factors, you know, I basically said to them, you just need to stop doing this because you could be hurting yourself. You could be helping yourself. We have no idea. Um, in order to do a good AB split test, you're actually going to need to go outside of the functionality that your ESP provides. You're going to need mm -hmm. to take a look at your list. My rule is at least 20,000 per cell, which means you need at least 40,000 to test. If you have less than that on your list, you can test something that's universal over a few sends. Yeah. But um, you can also use a sample size calculator to figure out what your sample size should be. Tim Watson has one on, online that's really great. Um, but that's the problem. I, I rarely end up using any of those A-B split tests that are built into the ESPs because they're just useless. I had a client years ago that was doing the same thing with subject lines before every send. And, you know, again, same problems, not stat sig, not working off, you know, in that case, they were just trying to drive traffic to a site. So their KPI was total clicks, not <laughs> click through rate, but total clicks, yeah. not basing it on that. And the other great thing is they had it set up to do a test before every send. And one option was newsletter four and today's date. And the other option was the title of the first article in the newsletter. And literally, when we looked back, the title of the article in the, of the first newsletter article always won, always beat the static, which is not surprising. And I said, it's time to turn it off. And they said, but but what if? The, when they set it up, they told us we should always do this. And I said, why? It never wins. <laughs> it never <laughs> wins. So that's another thing with – there's a lot of – um misunderstanding about how to do A-B split testing out there. There's a lot of, like I said, even the ESP vendors, I know they have the the, the best intentions, but the, the, the things that they're setting up for clients are typically not very good. And they're giving clients a false sense of security that they're doing a good job on their A-B split testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a mm -hmm. shame. It's got to stop. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got to do it manually right now, or you've got to use a third-party software. But yeah, that functionality in your ESP for A-B split testing, just ignore it. Definitely don't pay extra for it. <laughs> Can you provide another example of a small details worth paying attention to? One of the things I did um, a while ago was uh, a case study I wrote up for my blog, mm -hmm. which is at emailopshop.com, uh -huh. um, was about email list growth, which I think is really important to any program. You always want to be bringing new names on file. And there's a couple of reasons. It's not just to keep your list, list a decent size, because you want to make sure that you're bringing on more people than you lose yeah. through unsubscribes and attrition. Um, but the other reason that it's very important to have good list growth is that those new names, they perform a lot better than people who've been on your list a while. They open at a much higher rate. Mm -hmm. They click at a much higher rate. They convert at a much higher rate. Yeah. So that's another reason the higher percentage of your list that is you know, um, newer, the better your performance is going to be. So it's interesting because a few years ago, it was actually when I was consulting for the American Institute of Architects. It's the first time I heard this. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going through a site redesign with them. 
And um, the site designer put the email sign up in the footer. And I was like, no, 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 it needs to be above the fold. And they were like, no, 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 it, it belongs in the footer. That's it's the best always practice. There. <laughs> yeah, it belongs in the footer. And I was sort of sh shocked. And so um, one of the things that I started testing was when I ran into people like AIA and other places where it was in the footer is we started testing, putting it above the fold. And every time, every time I am able to test moving that call to action from the footer to above the fold, we see a lift in, in list growth because people are only going to the footer if they're looking for return policy mm -hmm. or complain about something. Um, the case study that I wrote up earlier this year, we actually got a 46% increase in email list growth just by moving that email sign up from the footer to the to, to above the fold, to the header. We didn't make any other changes to it. Amazing. Um, and I've seen similar increases, like I said, every time I test it. So, you know, if you're a web designer, it may be a best practice in your world, but if you actually want to grow your list, it needs to be above the fold. Um, and I think the, the biggest reason I hear for people not wanting it above the fold is that it's not their their primary goal for the website. Well, but I don't want to, you know, deter people from buying. I don't want to deter people from filling out a lead gen form. And I hear that. But a very small percentage of your site visitors are probably going to be able ready to do that on the first visit. And if they're not ready to take that action that you want on the first visit, um, it's much better if they sign up for email mm -hmm. before they leave than if they don't. Because if they don't sign up for email, you have no way to go contact them again and reach out. And the chances of them coming back to your site are very slim. Whereas if you get the ability to get their email address, you can email them, you can start building a relationship. I kind of think of it back in the day, we used to have a lot of fun at conferences because there were a lot of a dating analogies that we used for email. So I almost feel like it's, it's kind of like, no, if they come to the site, I want them to buy. If they're not going to buy, mm -hmm. I don't want to distract them from that. But that's a high commitment. There's a high level of commitment there. It's almost saying like, I'm going to go to a bar and I'm just going to start asking people to marry me. Yeah. If they're not willing to marry me, that's it. I don't care. And that's not how it works with relationships. So getting someone's email address is, is sort of like getting your digits and it gives you the ability to start building a relationship with them. Then the more they know about your brand through an excellent welcome series um, and informational content, as well as, you know, sales content, um, the more likely they are to come back and buy. And that's really what email is about. You said earlier that uh, even people in the email industry find email metrics unclear. What's your favorite email metric? Yeah, so um, RPE, revenue per email, is my very favorite metric of all time. Hands down, no <laughs> question. Um, it's easy to calculate. You take the revenue that that campaign generated and you divide it by the number of emails that you sent. So it's very easy to calculate. It's much easier to calculate than return on investment, ROI, or even uh, return on ad spend, ROAS. Mm -hmm. Um and, and it's a great, you know, if you do an A-B split test and you use your revenue per email as your KPI, mm -hmm. you're very clearly going to see which email drove more revenue for every email that you sent. Um, and that's why it's my very favorite metric. It's a much better KPI than an open rate or a click-through rate or anything like that. Um, revenue per email is a business metric. It goes mm -hmm. directly to your bottom line. Revenue for most companies is what keep the lights, keeps the lights on in their business. Um, if you are looking for lead gen from your email, if you need a sales rep to become involved before a sale's done, then you want to take a look at, you know, leads generated. But open and click-through rates are great diagnostic metrics, which means if you mm -hmm. are looking to improve your revenue per email, you can look at your open and click-through rates and you can kind of figure out which levers you need to shift to make that happen. So for instance, if you look at your open and click-through rates and you have a really good open rate and you have a poor click-through rate, then it's very clear you need to work on the body of your email and get that click-through rate up. A lot of people are using an open rate or a click-through rate as a KPI, which is a really bad idea. And we actually found, when I looked back at a series of testing I had done for a client in late 2020, mm -hmm. I looked at all of the tests. I looked at the winners based on, based on revenue per email. Yeah. And then I looked at the click-through rates for those. And what I found was only in 7% of the cases did, the, did a higher click-through rate indicate a higher revenue per email? Interesting. Seven, 
7% of the cases. So if you've got a program right now and you're relying on click-through rate as your KPI, you could be getting it wrong 93% of the time. And that's pretty scary. And open rates too, especially now with MPP. I mean, open rates were never an absolute measure. Yeah. There was always a margin of error. Now there's an even higher one. Um, if you're testing subject lines, you do not want to be using open rate as your KPI um, because it's not about getting them to open the email. It's about getting them to convert or turn into a lead or whatever you need past the email. And so um, even if you're testing subject lines, you want to use a, a, a business metric, not a diagnostic metric like open rate to be your KPI. It's also a great way to convince management of things, because if you can say this email that we send, and this is an actual, I had a client that we were doing card abandonment emails. Mm -hmm. Every card abandonment email we sent generated $16. Well, how would you like it if every email you sent generated $16? I mean, we'd all be very wealthy. Um, there were other emails that generated 0.016. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk to management about what we need to be doing, <clears throat> Stuff like that makes it really clear and it's hard for them to argue with those numbers. Like I said, unless it's like, oh, well, that was the message from the president. We need to keep doing it. But it's hard to argue with, you know, this is a limited resource. If we overmail our list, they're going to stop opening and responding. There's erosion that happens. And so, you know, you need to make sure you're not overmailing. Um, yeah. You could be undermailing. That happens. But in general, if you're overmailing, you want to you want to get rid of those things that aren't generating enough revenue for every hit. I also have had clients where this is, this is the best where you're sending an email and the number of unsubscribes is greater than the number of clicks. So you're sending this email and more people are raising their hand and saying, take me off your list. Don't ever email me again. than are saying, oh yeah, this is interesting. Let me learn more. So that's another thing you can take a look at and you need to decide. And that's, you know, typically if it's an email like that, it's going to have a very low revenue per email. Mm -hmm. But if it's got a low revenue per email and your unsubscribe rate is higher than your click through rate, because unsubscribes are not included in click-through rate, then that's definitely an email that needs to either be dramatically changed or just go away because yeah. that's doing more harm than good. I often hear you talk about two email metrics, open reach and click reach. Can you explain why these metrics are important? So if you're doing a multi-effort series, let's say you have a three-effort welcome series or even more common, let's say you have a three-effort abandoned cart series. Mm-hmm. Rather than, or in addition to looking at each performance of each one individually, which you should do, what you really yeah. want to get to is the performance of the three of them together, because that's really what matters. It's like every email stands alone, but together they're supposed to be greater than the sum of their parts. So for instance, let's say that for each of those mm -hmm. emails, you get a 4% click-through rate. So then you have to ask yourself, well, <laughs> is it a different 4% of people every time? Is it really a 12%? Yeah that I've got clicking or is it the same 4%? Because that's a big difference, right? If it's the same 4%, that's okay. But if it's it's a different 4% or, you know, significantly, so that's what that's what click reach tells you because mm -hmm. click reach takes a look at the number of people you send to, so not the email sent, but the number of people you send to. And mm -hmm. then every send it adds the new people who clicked, who didn't click on the first mm -hmm. one. So if you're doing yeah. a, a multi-effort series, that's really what you want. Because in the multi-effort series, you want to see the number of unique clickers grow with each email. That also gives you a good idea. If you still, let's say you're doing a three-effort series, and let's say you still see significant growth in new clickers on that last email, that suggests you should be doing another effort because there's the potential for even more. So that's that's why click reach is really important. And I think it's a shame not many ESPs will give you that right out of the, the box. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit daunting to try to calculate if you're working with really big lists, which a lot of my clients are. You need to get a data analytics person involved because you've got to dedupe the, the, the unique clickers for each one. But it can be really useful to see what's going on. The other thing we find is sometimes there's an effort in the middle where we really don't get any new clickers at all. So for that one, you'd look at that and go, wow, so maybe we should move it. Maybe we should get rid of it. Maybe we should change it. So it gives you a lot more insight into what's happening with that series. And it gives you a lot more avenues to consider for hypotheses to do A-B split testing to boost performance. You know, I never seen an email platform that offers these metrics. It's up to you to do the calculation yourself. Yeah, I think this is really important. Um, you've got to know how to calculate these metrics and you've got to understand what's behind them. 
Um, I can't tell you how many times I, it happened uh, like a month or two ago. I was working with a client. They sent me over their metrics mm-hmm. and uh, I, I had to send a note back and say, so I, I'm pretty sure these are total opens, not unique opens. And the answer came back. Nope. Nope. Those are unique opens. <laughs> and I said, well, your open rates are coming in at 109 to 194%, which tells me that they can't be unique opens because you can't (laughs) have unique people. You understand, right? If you're sending to a hundred people and you're, you're, you're telling me you had 194 unique opens, that's just not possible. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one thing that people need to know enough about the metrics that they, that they know, Oh, an open rate can't be greater than a hundred percent. Um, and they have to understand the difference between a total open and a unique open. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to understand how to calculate these things. I talked to another person the other day and we were talking about, and you know, we're going to get into Apple MPP more a little bit later, but we were talking about open rates and how they're not useful anymore. And then I asked about her click through rates and she said, Oh, we don't, we don't look at our click through rates. We focus on our click to open rates, which Mm -hmm. is calculated by clicks divided by opens. And I said, well, You understand that's tainted now too with Apple MPP. You can't rely on CTOR anymore. And she said, oh, yes, we can because it's not open rate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but the reason open rate's bad is because the opens are inflated. And so anything you're using opens for is now going to be wrong. It's going to inflate your denominator, which is going to make the whole number smaller. And and she was like, oh, Oh. I never thought about that. (laughs) Email has been around for over 50 years. Do you think it will eventually be replaced? It's funny. Years ago, um, I was talking with family members who I, who I love, and uh, I had started my consultancy a few years earlier. And I'll never forget, because it was over dinner one night, and they were like, so um, since email's dying, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to switch to like search yeah. engine marketing? Like, and I'm like, I don't I'm dying. <laughs> it's not dying. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's totally dying. We read about that in the newspaper. It's yeah. dying. Um, but yeah, I, no, I don't think it's dying. I, I'll tell you, as much as there's things like Apple MPP that are making it more difficult for us to do a good job for our subscribers, because that's really what Apple MPP does. It interferes with that relationship between you and your subscribers. Um, there are a lot of other things going on which suggest a very bright future for email. So one of the big ones is um, basically uh, the the banning of third-party cookies which if you've been reading anything about that, a lot of the browsers now, there are third-party cookies on there that have information about all of us as we browse. And then there are ad networks and other people who you can buy in to get that information on the third-party cookie, and then you can serve ads based on it. Programmatic marketing is for digital display advertising is completely de- dependent on that. That's actually going away. The, uh, the end date got pushed out a bit. But it's still going to go away, and I, I believe it with the increased concerns over privacy. So that's one thing that works well for email because you don't need a third-party cookie to send email to your subscriber list. Um, you also, if you're in email marketing and have a subscriber list, it's an amazing opportunity to get zero and first-party data on those folks, which is data that they themselves provide to you. So, for instance, um, my brother's a big Dave Matthews Band fan, and so I signed up for emails and texts from them. They asked me when my birthday was, what what month. I was happy to let them know what month my birthday is. They gave me a discount on on my birthday month in return for that. So that's a, an idea of them collecting zero, zero party data. They asked me, I told them I got you know a, a discount for it. Um, so that is going to bode very well for the future of email. The other thing that bodes very well for the future of email is people's um, disillusionment with social media platforms. I don't know about you, Sela, but when Elon Musk announced that he was buying Twitter, I had yeah. a bunch of people that I follow and a bunch of people that I know personally who left the Twitter platform. They were like, we are just done with this. Um, I have had, I had another friend a week or two ago who left Facebook, no longer doing Facebook. And I, I've had people leaving Facebook for, for years now. So people are becoming disillusioned with these social media networks. A lot of companies, you know, social media has been very sexy for a long time. Email's not sexy. Social media yeah. is sexy. You know, TikTok. Oh, we got to be on TikTok. <clears throat> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the problem with those platforms is that the user, the, the, the person that you're trying to reach has a relationship with that platform, not with you. So when you're communicating with someone, you know, they're, you're, you're, you're on Twitter and you're trying to sell to your, your Twitter, Twitter followers and you want them to, to buy, um, when they leave the platform, 
they leave you and you have no way to find them again. And that's not something that happens in email. No one owns the email platform. The relationship is between you and the subscriber directly. If the subscriber doesn't want to have that relationship anymore, they can unsubscribe. But that's the problem with these social media platforms. That's the problem with investing. A lot of people listening to this probably aren't old enough to remember MySpace, but I remember (laughs) MySpace. Everyone was on MySpace. And then Facebook launched, and then no one was on MySpace. And I think that we're going to see that happen with a lot of these platforms. Like I said, we're already seeing it. And so you don't want to put too much of your focus and resources into building relationships on these platforms where you don't own these subscribers. And if they leave the platform that they have the relationship with, you have no way to get back in touch with them. So I think that also bodes well for email because it is that one-to-one relationship between you and the subscriber. So I don't think it's going away anytime soon. You know, years ago, people were saying, well, high school students don't use email, so it must be dead. And Lauren McDonald, um, who was with Silver Pop, who now does uh, EV adoption, uh, said, Mm -hmm. really? Because high school students don't drink really high quality red wine, but I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, So it's really just a preference. I, I have nieces and nephews you know, and agreed they didn't use email when they were in high school, but now that they're out of college and they have jobs, they use email because business runs on email. Um, so no, I don't think email is going away anytime soon. I think it's going to continue to change and morph, but that's what makes it fun. That's why we all love being in this industry, but yeah, no emails, emails not going anywhere. Um, and you know, I think it's like, it's like television, television didn't kill the radio. Because there are times when you can't or you don't want to see the image. Oftentimes, if I can't be at a hockey game, I'm a big Washington Capitals fan. Um, you know, I will listen to games because the the hockey announcers are really good at, at giving you a visual in your head about what's going on on the ice. Um, and if I'm listening to a game, I can be working or cooking or multitasking, you're driving around, doing errands. Um, so I think email is very much like that. I mean, I, I use text messaging. I get text messages from brands. Um, it just depends on what information you want to convey. I mean, going back to the Dave Matthews example, they sent me a text mm-hmm. message to ask for what, what month I was born in. And I responded immediately. That was an easy answer. I knew the answer off the top of my head. If they had sent that via email, it would have been a really short email and it probably yeah. wouldn't have gotten as much response. If they had piggybacked it on another message in an email, it probably would have gotten missed. So for quick mm-hmm. communications like that, SMS text is, is great. Um, but it's not so good for longer form stuff. I mean, we talked earlier about my, my client who was sending, you know, multiple product information about multiple products in an email. That would be a terrible text message. Hi, let me tell you about our six new products with images. That would be a terrible text message. Nobody would want that. So you just want to pick the right channel for your communications and there's place for all the channels. Perfect. Cool. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you, Sela. Take care. Have a good day.